Hey, campfire crew, let's get it on. My New Orleans Experience by Much Credit This is an account of some events that happened to me two years ago in New Orleans. I haven't spoken about this to anyone. Like me, my friends and family are not believers in the paranormal. I just don't have any explanation for what happened to me. A few years ago, I took a series of jobs in hospitality as a way to travel to different parts of the U.S. In 2022, I took a position at a small hostel in New Orleans. The hostel is a beautiful Victorian house just on the edge of the French Quarter, and I was really excited about using it as my base to explore the city and the state of Louisiana. Like most old houses, the building had some quirks. You know how wood settles in old houses? Sometimes it would sound like there were footsteps upstairs. Guests in room 3 would always come down to reception to check if there was a problem with the air conditioning. That room was always cold. I remember the Yale lock on the front door would start whirring for no reason, despite changing the batteries and the lock itself. It was a few weeks into my stay there that things began to get strange. It started with the candlestick. It was autumn, and since the peak season was now done, we decided to deep clean the house, including the top floor, which wasn't open to guests. I remember reaching up to dust the top of a bookshelf when my hand hit something. There was a sudden crash that made me freak out that I'd broken something. I'd knocked something heavy sounding off the top of the bookshelf, and it had fallen, luckily, into an open cardboard box instead of denting the wooden floors. I looked at it, turning it around in my hand. It was covered in cobwebs and what looked like rust, but I could see that underneath all that was a beautiful, ornate candlestick. I put my hand on top of the bookshelf again, feeling around for its pair, but I couldn't find it there, or anywhere else around the room. I'm pretty sure I went to look for the other staff right then, wanting to show them this beautiful candlestick, and to ask if they'd seen the other one. I thought it would be good to put them out on display. The first person I came across was a girl I'll call Megan. I showed it to her excitedly, asking if she'd seen the other one, but she just raised her eyebrows and said it was creepy and to chuck it out. I argued that it just needed cleaning up, and I ended up taking it to the bathroom, washing off all the cobwebs and the rusty stuff, which luckily washed off without any difficulty. I never did find the other one, but I did find a candle for this one and put it on display on the dining room table. Around that time, I started sleeping badly. It wasn't nightmares exactly, I just never woke up feeling rested. It was like the feeling you get right when you wake up, just after your dog dies or you've got your heart broken. It's a feeling of dread sinking in your stomach, just for a second, knowing something is wrong, waiting for the memory to hit again. But it never did, and I never knew why I felt that way. It was just something I went through every morning. I don't remember now if it was the next morning or a few days later, but I went to put out the breakfast, and the candlestick wasn't on the table anymore. I didn't think anything of it. I mean, people get drunk on Bourbon Street, come back late, and do weird things. I found it under the table, and then I put it back where it was. The next day, though, it had moved again and this time I found it on the other side of the room. And strangely, the rusty substance was there again, creeping slowly back up the base of the candlestick. A few days later, it had moved again, and I had to spend a good amount of time searching for it. I was already in a bad mood that morning because of something that had happened the night before. I wanted to go see a friend's jazz band that evening and asked if someone would switch shifts with me. I'd switch shifts as a favor to them more times than I could count. Most people like to go out in the evening in New Orleans to enjoy the nightlife, but I was studying on the side and enjoyed the quieter nighttime shifts where I could sometimes read a little and would often stay at the desk after the end of the shift to study in peace and quiet. But I didn't understand why it was that one time that I asked to go out in the evening that everyone avoided my eyes and just shuffled awkwardly. 
Why were they so selfish when I asked them to switch with me? After what happened to me later, I have an idea why they didn't want to be alone there after dark. Anyway, that morning I was looking for the candlestick. I didn't blame partygoers anymore and had a good idea who kept moving it. A few nights before, I'd come up from the evening shift to the kitchen. It was dark and all the lights were off, and I'd come into the dining room. I'd glimpsed Megan standing there looking at it. Even though I only saw her from behind, I knew it was her. She was the only girl there with long, dark hair, and she said the candlestick was creepy the first time she saw it. I found it again, this time shoved in the bottom of the storage closet, and when I saw Megan, I confronted her, telling her to stop moving the candlestick. She said she didn't. I was holding it in my hand and felt this consuming rage flow through me. Honestly, a kind of anger way out of proportion to what was happening. It was just for a second, and I came to my senses. And she was looking at me with wide eyes, and I put the candlestick back on the table. After that, I kept seeing the candlestick in the dining room, and I felt a little embarrassed about almost losing my temper with Megan. I didn't know why she lied about moving it, but I prided myself on being professional, and I didn't feel good about what had happened. I felt guilty every time I looked at it. One day, while cleaning... I randomly moved it into room four, where I wouldn't walk past it several times a day. I didn't plan on keeping it there, but that room wasn't going to be occupied for a few days. A little while after this, something else happened. One night I'd finished the evening shift and began studying at the front desk. It was just after 1 a.m. when I heard footsteps in the corridor behind me. I recognized the woman who came into the lobby, and she was staying upstairs in one of the dormitories. Due to a missed flight, a party of four people who were due to stay in that dormitory had not arrived. They had phoned earlier telling me they had decided to stay in Fort Lauderdale another week and wanted to reschedule their whole stay. So this lady was staying alone in what I think was a five-bed dormitory. When I saw her, her hair was messed up and she looked really tired, so I was immediately concerned. I think I asked her if everything was all right, and she asked me if I could check on the person in the room next to hers, because it seemed like they had been crying for hours. She hadn't been able to sleep because of the noise, and was pretty worried that the person in there was not doing okay. So, I followed her upstairs to knock on the door where she'd heard the crying, taking the keys with me in case I needed to let myself into the room. Next to hers was one of the dormitories, it had eight or so beds, but tonight there were only a couple of girls staying there. I stopped outside and raised my hand to knock on the door when she stopped me. She said the crying had actually been coming from the room opposite her. Room four. Now I'd assume she meant the dormitory because that room was occupied. Room four was not. I told her that, but she seemed certain that the crying had been coming from that room. Right then, there was nothing other than silence and the creaking of the old house, and I tried to reassure her that the noise she heard was probably one of the hostel's cats, or another animal. I'd heard that there's a kind of swamp rat in Louisiana that can sound like a baby crying, and I've heard foxes in the woods before that sound like a woman being murdered. I'm no stranger to the unsettling sounds wild animals can make. But to put her mind at ease, I decided to check room four. I opened the door and switched on the light. No one was there. I gave her my reassurances, and she went back to her room. But something else had caught my eye, though. The lampshade on the far side of the bed was torn, and something was on the pillow. I walked around the bed and then saw what had happened. On the pillow were some small shards of broken glass, and on the floor was the candlestick. It was as if it had been thrown across the room at the lamp, torn through the fabric of the lampshade and smashed the light bulb. Something I probably should have mentioned. Megan had returned to her home country before I took the candlestick in this room. I had a bad feeling right then and there that it had never been her moving it at all. I didn't see much of the woman over the next couple of days, up until one morning I was working reception. I heard the sound of suitcase wheels and quick footsteps coming down the tile corridor. It was her, 
the woman who had heard the crying, saying she wanted to check out. She still had three nights left on the reservation, so I asked lightly if there had been a change of plans. She just shook her head, and when I looked at her face, she looked pale, with dark circles under her eyes as if she hadn't slept. I tried asking her if there was a problem with the room or anything we could do to help her enjoy her stay, but she just shoved the keys at me and was gone. Once she left, I went up to her room. I wondered what had made her act so weird. I checked all over the room, but I never found out. A few days later, room four was booked, and I meant to take the candlestick back to the dining room. Instead, I put it in the cleaning caddy, forgot about it, and it made its way downstairs with me. Rather than take it back upstairs, I decided to take it to my room and return it to its spot the next day. Something happened that night that almost made me leave the hostel. Even writing about it now makes me feel uncomfortable. I woke up that night to the sounds of someone moving around in my room. I was still half asleep and thought I was dreaming, but in a way I can't describe, I knew somehow that those noises weren't coming from inside my mind. They were coming from somewhere in the room. I heard footsteps, rustling, and then finally the feeling of someone or something sitting down on the bed. I remember the weight of it, the way it depressed the mattress, and somehow I just knew that whatever it was, wasn't human. I kept as still as I could, but my heart was beating so hard I was sure that whatever it was would hear it. It seemed to sit there for a long time, while I lay there, too afraid to move, my every nerve attuned to it. After a time, I felt the bed move again, and it was gone. I never heard the door open or close, and I remember lying there for a long time, the covers pulled over my head, hearing my heart beating against the mattress, sounding like footsteps, too terrified to move. It was after this that I started looking into leaving New Orleans. I slept with the lights on, and only a kind of twitching, nervous half-sleep at that. My heart was always beating too fast and too hard in my chest. The lack of sleep wasn't helping, I knew, but I was afraid of sleep. I constantly felt like there was someone behind me, and I kept imagining footsteps coming down the corridor. One morning, another staff member went to start their shift, and the keys were gone. This irritated me because there were three sets when I'd finished my shift the night before. I can't explain why this angered me as much as it did. I'm not usually quick to anger. But I just felt this rage building inside me again, and a sense of being so deeply wronged. Looking back, I'm pretty sure no one made any accusations against me or anyone else. But I just felt everyone was accusing me of having lost them because I was on shift the previous night. I started demanding to view the cameras to see who had taken the keys. I think everyone just wanted me to calm down, so the manager went and got out the laptop and brought up the video feed. We found the night's footage, and there was me getting everything done, three sets of keys hanging up. Me turning off the light and leaving. And then we started skipping through the footage, until we saw the door open again, at 1.33 a.m. That's when I saw the worst thing I'd ever seen. Myself. I saw myself enter the lobby, take the key off the wall, and head down the corridor. There's a sick horror I can't describe in seeing yourself doing something you have no memory of doing, realizing your own body isn't something you're in control of. I think I apologized. I really hope I did. I left the same day. I'd never slept walk before, and have no explanation for what happened. Thankfully, since I left, I haven't had anything weird happen. I've been able to move on with my life and think about it less and less. But sometimes I can still see that video in my mind's eye and feel the sensation of the mattress sinking as whatever it was sat watching me. New Orleans is amazing, and the house was beautiful. But whatever happened to me was the most terrifying experience of my life.
The Man Outside by Tran Z-Boy. I was in second period math class one day with my four other friends. For privacy reasons, I'm calling them L female, S female, J female, and Z male. We had a very chill and laid-back teacher, where as long as you finished your work on time, you could relax and rest for the rest of the class. But that day, we felt like working out in the hall. In a way, I felt like my teacher knew we wouldn't do anything if we went outside of the classroom, but she let us out anyway. Little did me and my friends know, we were about to experience something that would scar us forever. Before you ask, we live in an area in the South. Crazy stuff happens a lot more than most places. While me and my friends were talking, I had an odd feeling, one I had never had before. Like someone was watching me. Hey, do you guys feel that? I said with a shake in my voice. My stomach was turning. This was weird for me because I barely get scared at all, but I couldn't shake that feeling of dread. I do. Could any staff be out there? Z asked, looking oddly concerned. It was odd. I was used to his cheery class clown personality, and I had never seen him like this before. Why the hell would they be outside? It's pouring. And it's almost pitch black, too, I replied. Me and all my friends glanced anxiously towards the glass exit door to hear a slight scurrying where the dumpster was. But it was too loud and heavy to be an animal, because it's not like we have bears nearby. Then, just as fast as the sound began, it stopped, and we all saw a tall man run in front of our eyes, running past the glass door. I froze. I felt like vomiting, and Elle was about to tear up in pure anguish and fear. We saw it all in front of our eyes. We would have thought it was one of our teachers, but all of the teachers in our school are female, except my coach. But this man was too short to be him. I was shaking uncontrollably, so I said with my heart in my throat, I'm going to go get the resource officer. Jay, could you come with me? She complied, and we ran away to go get the resource officer. We went to his office and told him what happened. We returned within a couple of minutes, and when we came back, my friends Z, L, and S were as pale as ghosts. They explained that they saw him running back and forth in front of the glass and tapping on it again and again. The officer didn't find anything, and he looked at us like we were liars. So we just decided to keep working to keep our minds off it but we all heard something that will echo in my mind forever. Two taps on the window. We all glanced over to see a man we'd never seen before, looking at us. His disgusting face. Z opened his mouth to shout something, but nothing came out. I saw the guy mouth, let me in. Jay pointed at his back pocket, and I saw it. The blade of a kitchen knife. We all rushed back inside, banging on the door, and I was the last one to go in, but I saw the guy again. He was crouched in the nearby woods. After we told my teacher, we went into a lockout. In case you don't know, a lockout is when you can't leave the classroom, but not a lockdown. Me and all my friends still talk now, but L doesn't like talking about it. We tried to block it out, but we just couldn't. So honestly... We just don't talk about it anymore. Working Late, submitted by Andrea. This takes things back to the early 90s and my time working in a video store. It wasn't a blockbuster or other chain video place. It was a locally owned video store. You know, with the back room for adult films... That section was separated from the rest of the store with some beads hanging down between it and the rest of things. The beads were there for two reasons. One, they blocked the titles and images from the general public. And two, when anyone went through them, we knew someone was back there. Honestly, it was really a deterrent to keep the underage kids out. But I would find them back there from time to time, giggling at the titles and box covers. One night, I was working solo. By my name, you already know I'm a female. 
It was a Friday night, and I wanted to be anywhere but there. But I drew the short stick that week and had to hold down the fort until 11. My co-workers and I all split the Friday and Saturday night shifts, so we didn't have to work them both every week. And our owner was a good guy, but he never worked past 7 or 8. Which was his privilege. I mean, he did own the place. So, things slowed down around 10, and I was just rewinding movies and making notes of the accounts of people that didn't rewind. We charged 50 cents for every movie returned that wasn't rewound. And I was watching Point Break for the zillionth time. It was another hot summer night, and I was looking forward to meeting some friends at a bar in the same strip mall our store was located in. I heard the front door jingle, letting me know that I had a customer, and I looked up to see a middle-aged guy walking in. It was hot out, but this dude was sweating profusely, like he had just run a marathon or something. I said hello, and asked him if he was looking for anything in particular. He stopped walking and looked at me for a minute. Then he just said, no, getting something for my kids. He then went to our kids section and grabbed a random Disney movie and stood there for like five minutes saying and doing nothing. Then he kind of looked around and headed for the back room. Whatever, I thought. It was usually a tactic for the porno crowd. Get a regular title and then get what you really came for. He went through the beads and I kept doing what I was doing, and about 15 minutes went by and he hadn't come back out. So I went to the doorway and asked again if he needed anything. He almost dropped the box of a movie he was looking at and said, Oh, you scared me. Hey, you look just like the woman in this movie. Is it you? My jaw dropped open when I looked at the box. It was a particularly raunchy film called Anal Angels or something like that. My memory's foggy about that detail. I just said, hell no, and went back to my counter. What a fucking weirdo, I thought. A few minutes later, he came out with that movie and another equally gross titled film and set them on the counter. He was still sweating bullets. I asked him if he had a membership, but I hadn't seen him in the store before. He said no, and I let him know that there was a $25 charge for non-members that was refundable when he brought the movies back, but he could become a member for 30 and there would be no extra fee. Always be upselling, my boss would say. He said, no thanks, I only need him for the night. Okay, I thought, and then I took another look at him. Short and on the chubby side, a bad Hawaiian shirt and flip-flops, and sweating like a pig. As I was ringing him up and making a note of the title on our POS computer, I noticed that he was breathing heavily. Do you have a boyfriend? he asked. I stopped what I was doing. Excuse me? I asked, and he asked me again. Yeah, I do, I said in an annoyed voice. Does he care that you do movies like this? he said and tapped his finger on the movie box. What the hell are you talking about? That's not me, I said and put the tapes in a box. Will that be all? He looked at me for a long minute, breathing heavily and sweating, and said, No, that's it. I'll see you soon. I just handed him his stuff and the change, and he walked out. And it took me a minute to register the I'll see you soon, but I immediately chalked it up to meaning that he'd be bringing the videos back the next day. No one else came in for the rest of the night, and I finished up and closed the store, and then headed for the bar to meet my friends. Of course, I told them all about the strange guy, and we all got a laugh out of the movie titles he picked, and talked about what pervs people can be. Around 1 a.m., I decided to head home, and my friend Chuck walked me to my car. Chuck became a state police guy the next year, and even then he was always the protector of our group. I guess that doesn't add much to the story, but I'm telling everything that happened. I thanked him and I got in my Beetle and then remembered I left my Walkman in the video store. So I drove over to it and parked in the fire lane and got out to get my tunes. When I came back out of the store, I felt a hand grab my arm and pull me towards the little alley between our shop and the next group of buildings. I started to yell out, hey, when a hand clamped over my mouth and I was being dragged away from my store and car. 
Terror swept through my body, and I immediately started to fight my attacker, trying to break his grip. I heard his heavy breathing, and the image of the man in the store popped into my head, even though I couldn't see this guy. His other hand grabbed at my breasts, and I caught him a bit off guard with his hand over my mouth. It slipped, and I instinctively bit down on his fingers as hard as I could. The guy yowled in pain and let his grip go for a second, and I spun just a little bit and kneed him in the balls as hard as I could. He yelped again and let go of me, and I scrambled for my car, now screaming for help. I got to my car door and jumped in and reached for my keys, but I couldn't find them. Where the hell could they be? I was frantically looking for them and screaming, not looking to see where the guy was. But suddenly I heard a bang on my window, and there he was, standing there, holding my keys. In our little melee, I had dropped them. Fuck, 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 I thought as this guy calmly stood there reaching for my door handle. I was literally thrashing about in my seat and screaming to no one. He said, I just want you to act like you do in the movie one more time for me. I screamed again and again, and he began violently yanking on my door. And it became a kind of -of tug-of-war, him trying to open it, and me trying to close it. But it was open enough for someone to hear me screaming. At least I thought so. And I was right. A second later, the guy was gone from my door, and the face of the owner of the bar I had just been at was in my view. "'Are you okay?' he asked. And I just screamed, no. He said, oh, okay, okay, stay right there. I called the cops. I won't leave you here alone. I just sat there shaking and sobbing until a cop car pulled up and an officer got out. I started to get out and he said, ma'am, stay where you are for a minute. He then yanked the creepy guy up and put him in handcuffs. The guy was really out of it. The bar owner, Tony, had cracked him with a piece of concrete when he saw what was happening. The cop got the creepo into his car, and another cop car pulled up. They told me I could get out now, and asked me for my ID and all of that, and I gave them a detailed but somewhat jumbled version of the night's events. I was shaking so hard it was hard to talk. One of the cops called my parents and EMTs to check me out, but I told them I was fine. I was just really scared. My dad came out to the store and hugged me and held on to me while the cops talked to me some more and asked me to press charges, and I said, hell yes. When they searched the guy, they found a bunch of cocaine, condoms, and a tube of some kind of sex lube. When he came to, he kept babbling about saying I invited him to have anal sex after I told him I was an actor in a movie he had rented, and it was all my idea. He just wanted to meet me after seeing my friends, and now I was rebuffing him. I mean, it was really fucked up. This guy was so delusional. He was charged with all sorts of stuff. Attempted rape, assault, sexual assault, drug charges, and on top of it all, he was also on probation for another sex offense in DUI. He ended up getting sentenced to 96 months after a trial that he pled no contest to. I was a wreck for years after this and never worked at night in any job for a long, long time. I never went anywhere unless I was with a boyfriend or group of people, and I had a hard time sleeping. Sometimes people don't realize how much this stuff can fuck you up mentally, and it took me a long time to trust any strangers. It feels weird sharing the story with you, Uncle Josh, but even though I've been over it for a long time... Somehow this feels like a last step in closure. Telling a bunch of strangers to always be on your guard and never take any situation for granted. I'm lucky, I mean really lucky, that Tony was there to save my ass, literally. And my heart goes out to all the people who haven't been as lucky as me. To those of you who have been through something like this, I can't say enough about counseling and mental health wellness. There's help out there. Please get it, and don't let it ruin your life. God bless you all. The Woman at the Bridge by Matty Osk. 
This was back in January, earlier this year. My friend and I had just started working on our film project, and we were getting ideas of locations to shoot the film. We drove to a swinging bridge about an hour from our hometown, and it was your usual unsturdy bridge that was about 400 feet long and 60 feet above water. The bridge was only meant for walking, no running, biking, etc. It was parallel to another bridge, one made for vehicles. My friend and I got a couple of shots of the bridge itself before we made our way to the other side, where there were train tracks in a neighborhood. About halfway across the bridge, we heard yelling coming from the other one. We looked, and it appeared to be a lady waving her arms like she was trying to get her attention. She called out a name which I thought was Hayden or Aiden, which both of those were neither mine or my friend's. We yelled back, we're not them, thinking that would be the end of the conversation. The woman just stood there staring at us. We tried to shrug it off as we thought it had been settled, but then the woman took off at full speed running across the bridge in the same direction we were going. We thought it was strange, but we just laughed it off and carried on. We made it to the other side of the bridge and began shooting footage near the train tracks. I know, it's unsafe, but this was a regular crossing point for the bridge trail. While in the middle of a scene, I heard a familiar voice yell from behind me. It was the same woman yelling the same thing. She stood on top of the hill of that neighborhood across the tracks, and again we yelled back that we didn't know her, and we weren't who she thought we were. The woman took off running once again, but this time towards us. And this frightened us, because why would this woman need to get to us that bad? My friend and I quickly grabbed our things and headed for the swinging bridge, even knowing we weren't supposed to run across. We just walked super fast, which made the bridge sway. It was like our fight or flight kicked in. The lady had caught up to the start of the bridge by the time we made it halfway across, still yelling at us. But this time, it was in a hateful voice. This was when I turned around to look once to see how far the distance was between us. The lady had stopped there at the start of the bridge, and I noticed she was holding something behind her back. Even though she had stopped running after us, we continued to bolt across the bridge. We turned back once we reached the other side to see the woman still standing there, fiddling with something in her hands. My friend pulled out her phone and began recording the woman, and this made her turn back immediately and walk the other way. We never found out why she chased us or what she was holding in her hand. And sometimes I think back and wonder if maybe she just needed help. But why not scream for help? I just found it strange that after we told her multiple times that we weren't the people she thought we were, she still followed us. I had difficulty sleeping about a week after this incident, as I couldn't get the idea out of my head of what this woman wanted to do with us. I had never been so scared in my life. Lady at the Window by Jubel My health hasn't been the best for the past few years. I'd made several trips to doctors and specialists trying to find out what was wrong, and at the end of September 2022, I was sent for a whole barrage of tests, including an EKG, to measure my heart's electrical activity and a full blood count. That night, we received an urgent call from the doctor about the worrying test results. Rex rushed me to the emergency department at the hospital, and the nurse on duty took one look at me and said that my pallor was dangerously gray. Over the next 14 hours, I would be given two blood transfusions along with a bag of plasma. While I was waiting for a room to be prepared in the ward upstairs, the woman in the next bed became angry at the nurses. The doctors requested more tests and scans for her, and she was not pleased that they could not diagnose her reoccurring ailments. Her scolding voice soon rose in volume, getting the attention of everyone on the floor. By that time, it was close to midnight. The agitation level was almost a palpable presence in the place. I felt chilled and didn't feel it was due to my low blood count. I want to see the doctor now, screeched the irate woman. 
beep, 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 beep. The monitoring devices went haywire all at once, emitting alarms and sounds of mechanical distress at every single bed. It was absolute chaos. Nurses were hurrying from bed to bed, frantically pressing buttons to stop the ear-splitting blare and trying to reset each monitor. All the while, the woman carried on a relentless tirade, steamrolling over the nurse's attempts to calm her down. Rex and I looked at each other in bewilderment. What was going on? Eventually, the head nurse managed to placate the woman. She arranged for her discharge and assured her that any further tests could be done as an outpatient. It was rather odd how all the machines on the floor subsided to quieter beeps once she left the emergency department. Hospitals are never the most comfortable place to be. It was early morning and Rex had gone home by the time they got me into a room on the fourth floor. I was attached to uncomfortable tubes and a heart monitor. My arm was aching from the cannula, and my limbs felt weak and rubbery. But I was still in a much better state than the elderly woman in the next room. During the nurse's handover at the change of shift, I overheard one say to the other that the patient had been refusing her food. They were currently trying to get her into palliative care but it was probable that she might not last long enough by the time there was an available bed. Sadly, beyond making her as comfortable as possible, they could do nothing more. Sleep was impossible that night. My lower back hurt and I could not figure out how to adjust the bed. The temperature in the room had gone quite cold and it was unusual for me to be bothered by the air conditioning. I normally liked the cold, and the nurse had made me comfortable for the night, wrapping me up like a cozy burrito in cotton blankets. The lights at my bed were turned off, with the door left ajar for the duty nurse to be able to check on me at a glance from the bright hallway. I could hear the constant rasping and wheezing noises from next door. That poor woman's labored breathing sounded especially loud in the stillness of the night. It reminded me horribly of a death rattle like during the time I had sat vigil years ago for my father and Rex's mother. My vision had gotten accustomed to the dim lighting, and a movement to my left caught my eye. I blinked once, twice, but the image was still there at the window. It was a slightly built woman or a young girl dressed in a black gown and a wide-brimmed black hat. Her face was pale, and the features hidden in shadow by a gauzy veil from the hat. A coat was draped over her shoulders like a cloak, and from the angle of her head, she was peering in at me. For a moment, I thought it was a visitor who had gone for a walk outside, taken a wrong turn in the dark and was trying to find the entrance back to the ward. And then I remembered, I was in a room four stories above the ground. Was she an otherworldly visitor? I didn't feel any malice from her, only a vague sense of curiosity. On a whimsical impulse, I waved to the lady in black, acknowledging that I knew she was there. Then I quickly turned on the bedside light. The figure disappeared. Getting out of bed, I scanned the room for any object that could be reflected in the glass, and there was nothing that matched the figure. The closest thing in height was the IV stand, but it was too thin. It was also near the door, which meant that its reflection was in the wrong position. When I mentioned this to the night nurse in passing, she vehemently declared that such things never happened there. She looked so thoroughly spooked that I decided not to say anything further on the incident. The hospital was a fairly new one, but there had already been a number of reported mortalities there. In the morning, I checked the scenery outside the window. It overlooked the rooftop of the nearby building, a car park, and the main road in the distance. There was nothing that could have formed a dark shape the night before, and the ledge running along the side was too narrow for even Spider-Man to stand on tippy-toes. The patient was still there in the next room, her condition unchanged, but I didn't get another chance to see if the lady in black would reappear in the night. My daily blood test showed that my blood count was much improved, oxygen saturation and erratic heart rate had stabilized. By late afternoon... The doctors decided to send me home for recovery and be scheduled for surgery at a later date. That night, as part of my normal bedtime routine, 
I did an online crossword. One of the crosswords eerily read, You look like you've just seen a ghost. Hey gang, thanks for listening to this episode of Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories. If you have a true scary story of any nature that you'd like to hear narrated on this channel or my podcast, email it to Uncle Josh True Scary Stories at gmail.com. I read them all. If you are so inclined, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Leave a comment below, let me know what you think of the stories, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you'd like to take your support of the channel a step further, Find a link to my Patreon page in the description below, as well as a link to my T Public storefront. Get yourself some Uncle Josh and Campfire Crew merchandise. You can also follow me on social media. Links to that are also in the description. Everyone, be excellent to each other. And until next time, be wary of things that go bump in the night. It could be anything. A ghost, a monster, or the guy next door.